Y'all ready to start a brand new series this morning? Yeah! The five of you that are ready, I'm excited that you are here. Man, y'all are really kind of sleepy this, today. For some reason, it feels like it anyway. Maybe we're, we're going to wake up this morning. Brand new series, Book of Titus. Um, I know it's not, it's probably one of those uh, books that you're like, man, I don't know if I've even read this book for some of you. Others of you, I can't really remember what it's all about. It's not a, uh, a typical book, I would say. I mean, I'm sure there's some sermons that have been preached about it in, in churches all over the world, but it's not typically one of those ones that you go to and preach a series out of. But man, I, I am so excited about it. I, I, as I've gone through it, and the more and more I go through it, I just see things that are so beneficial to us. Not only that we need, just because we need the knowledge of the Bible, all of the Bible, to be able to see how it all fits. And if God put it in there, then it's in there for a reason. Amen? Amen. So it's something we should be wanting to read and understand and, and look at and go, okay, what should I know from this book? What is something that, how can it apply to my life? And I think there is so much of it to, uh, to be able to apply, be applied to our lives. Now, this book in particular, there is, uh, it, it's, it's written to Titus from Paul. So Paul was uh, on this island with him uh, called Crete. I'll show you a map in a second about that. Um, but there is this moment where he leaves and then he writes back to Titus and he's like, these are some things I want you to do, some things I want you to know. Um, if you're kind of a, a geek like me and you're a nerd maybe, like with you like maps or you like visuals and things, this is, this is where the island of Crete uh, sits. All the way down at the bottom, I don't know if all in the back you can see this or not, but Crete is at the very bottom there. It, it is, uh, it's a large island and it actually makes up uh, it's the largest of the islands that make up uh, Greece, modern day Greece. So uh, this is where they were. Um, and I, what I like about this, and when you read the book of Titus, is what it also reveals to us, kind of a side note, is, you know, this isn't part of Paul's missionary journeys. So we have a lot of information about Paul's missionary journeys, where he went. You know, look through the book of Acts, you can, you can see all kinds of things that Paul did. But this isn't in there. So we look at this and we're like, oh, so Paul did a lot of other stuff that we're not even privy to, that the other times he went places, planted churches, did things that you and I don't even, didn't even know about had it not been uh, written, this one written in scripture, then there's others I'm sure that we don't have any clue uh, that happened. And so what it shows us here uh, is that Paul is going to write to his missionary friend, Titus. It's kind of like a younger uh, version. He's trying to, he's training him up and uh, he's gonna write to him and he's gonna help him out. He's gonna ask him, to do something which is super, super important. Uh, and we're going to see that here in just, just a second. The thing is, though, where they are, right, this island of Crete or where they were when they were there together, this, this is kind of a crazy place. Crete was, was known for some crazy stuff. And we're going to read about some of it uh, this morning. And we're going to find out that this island of people, they really needed these churches and now these churches, as we're going to see today, really needed leadership. There was just a lot of really crazy stuff going on. A lot of false teachers running around, people claiming to be Christians, but then living like Christ didn't even exist. It was just full of a lot of sin. And when I say things like false teachers, I don't know what you think of, but I don't want you to think of things like, oh, this you know, person standing up and preaching and teaching in a public setting, and it's a false teacher. Those are false teachers. But we ha they're everywhere. I mean, if anyone that's going to say something that is not of the gospel, or even if they change it just a little bit, which seems to be the case a lot anymore, <clears throat> that's a false teacher. And there was a lot of that going on on the island of Crete. A lot of sinful things. And unfortunately, I just feel like we could use these same words to describe America today. It's like America's a bigger version of the island of Crete, filled with people who false gospel is running rampant. Just, I can't tell, I mean, I feel like probably every preacher long before me would, would have said this, probably for different reasons, but I don't think there's any more uh, of a more opportune time, a more important time that you know the Word of God. Because, man, is, can you get confused quickly. There's so much stuff out there that you read and you're like, oh, that kind of, well, is that true? If you don't know the Word of God, you're not going to be able to refute it. You're not going to be able to respond to it correctly. Matter of fact, you may be led astray in ways that you don't even know you're being led astray. And it happens all the time in America today. It's all over the place. And it's false teachers are sometimes, man, they're really, they're fun people. They, they're good-looking people. They're 
charismatic people. And, and so it's easy to follow them. You, you, you don't, I just don't want you to look at, oh, I would never follow some false teacher. I'm telling you, Satan knows the way to get a hold of us. And if you don't know what this says, you're going to fall to that trap. And you're going to end up believing things that are not true and that can lead you away from the Lord. So we see here, this letter is going to be written. Paul's already left the island, and he has left these churches in Crete in the hands of Titus. Uh, Titus is going to be tasked with this responsibility of getting things in order uh, in these churches. And I believe that these things are going to challenge us as a church as well. Uh, it's just so, so important that we understand this. We're going to begin uh, with how Paul begins his letter here. Now, Paul is kind of known. If you've read a lot of the Apostle Paul, he's written a, most of the New Testament. So if you read him, you, you know he kind of is known for kind of these run-on sentences or these long sentences. And that is kind of how he begins the letter here. Uh, but I also, there's just no way, or at least I would say a good preacher would never skip past this or just read it and go on. There's so much truth packed into what he just says. Paul's the only person I know that can write it, a little intro, and you could preach like three sermons on just this intro, just kind of describing who he is and what he stands for and why he does what he does, right? So we're going to start out, look at this, and then we'll get into the body of the letter. But uh, Titus chapter 1, and again, there's three chapters, so we'll spend three weeks, chapter apiece, going through this, and hopefully when we're finished, you'll have a much better understanding of this book and, again, things that you can apply to your own life through it. Titus 1, 1 through 9, where it starts out, though, with just this first verse, says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So if Paul starts off, and he just, he calls himself a servant of God. And then I want you to notice, he calls himself a servant of God even before he calls himself an apostle. I mean, it, it, when they did that, I mean, he was like, I'm going to list off first what's most important. And what's most important is not that I'm an apostle to me. What's most important is I'm a servant of God. <clears throat> now, you need to understand servant is also translated, may even be in some of the diversions that you're reading, as a slave or a bond slave. And when we hear the word slave, especially those of us who've grown up in America, we, we think of, of the slaves that we used to have the, in a very wrong way, right? I mean, it was, it was it's horrible, the slavery that we had in America, and so we kind of always hear the word slave and go straight to that. This was different in biblical times. These bond slaves were people that they owed a debt to someone. So they owed this debt, and when, because they owed the debt, they would go and be a slave or a servant to this person to work it off, to basically pay back the debt, and then they were freed. And so then, but then they also, so you know this part of it, there was moments where if that went really well for you, let's just say you owed a debt, you paid it off, but you really liked this master, this this what we would call today boss, um, that you liked working for them, it, they treated you well, you enjoyed what you were doing, you could actually uh, make a pact with them and say, listen, I'll, I'll be your, your servant, your employee. We don't usually use those words anymore, but uh, forever. <clears throat> so you could decide to work for them. So when you read it like that, <clears throat> when you read it like that, you, you kind of look at what Paul is saying here, and he, he's saying that he's a slave to Jesus first and foremost. And he understands that he owes a debt that he could never repay. He's like, I am a bond slave to Jesus. And so I will, I am first and foremost serving him. I know I could never repay this debt and I am forever indebted to him for what he has done. And then he says he's teaching truth to God's chosen people, knowing that the knowledge of the truth will lead them to godliness. That's really, really important. It's kind of what I've been saying this morning as we started this off. It should inspire us to want to know more of God's word because, as Paul says here, the knowledge of the truth has the power to help us lead a more godly life. This is, we don't read this just so we can seem smarter. This book has the ability to change our lives, to make us better people, to make us better followers of Jesus Christ. The truth that can transform us. It literally can change us. And many of you, you know, you're like, it's changed me. People see me today and they say, you know what? I'm not the same person. You're not the same person that I remember. I went to high school with you. You're, whoa, you're way different than you used to be. I knew you four years ago. And man, you're a totally different person than you used to be. It, you've been transformed by this truth. And so we see this God's word corrects us and it rebukes us and it encourages us, it teaches us and directs us in the way that we should go. So Paul says, this is what I do and I serve God by teaching the truth. Verse two, 
in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now, at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. He says it's this knowledge of hope, this hope of eternal life that God has promised, and he reminds us that God cannot and will not lie. That's why it's so good when we read these, these lyrics, we're, we're singing these lyrics, and it's like, it's truth. God can't lie. When God's told us these promises, they're going to come true if they haven't already. And so there's this encouragement, this reminder that God cannot lie. And then he says it will take place at his appointed season, meaning God has a plan. And he even says that that plan began before time began for us. It's just God is in control of all things. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life that I've had to hold on to that promise. God's in control. I think we've all been there, right? We've had things happen and we're like, man, I, I'm struggling to get through this, but I just hang on to God is in control. God is in control. And these are promises we've got to hold on to. And then Paul says, the way I do this, the way I teach this life transforming knowledge is through preaching. He's like, so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So that, he's basically, a, so far, he said, this is who I am. I just, I'm not ashamed of it. I want you to know who I am. And then I'm the one writing this letter. And then he starts in verse four. He says to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So this is where we find out Paul had been there, right? Obviously he says, I, I left you there. So Paul was there, we know that. He leaves, and in leaving him, the whole reason that Titus didn't leave, and when Paul left, he, says, he tells us that it was because there was this disorder in the churches, or at least the churches needed more order. They needed these people to rise up as leaders within the churches to make sure there was order within the churches. Remember, these are new churches, and they needed these these leaders to rise up. And it just shows us once again that God is a God of order, right? Many times I think we forget that. God's got a plan. God's a God of order. He doesn't like chaos and just, you know, this is where the whole doing things with excellence comes in as well. That's why when you are part of churches sometimes and they're just like, like I don't think anyone has a plan around here. I just think everyone just kind of just willy-nilly, whatever. And that God is a God of order. And he has a plan, and he has a way that he wants us to live. And he has a plan, as we read earlier, it's a plan that has been since the beginning. And it needs to have structure in order to make sure that things are running pop properly and that the correct doctrine is being taught. And so Paul says, the way I want you to do this, I want you to appoint these elders in every town that I tell you to. I'm gonna, I want you to go, and I want you to find these people that I'm going to describe to you, and I want you to put them in these leadership positions. And he gives Titus this description of what these men should be like. It's actually um, a recipe that we go off of still to this day, that this is what elders should look like within a church. It's verse 6 says, an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer, which by the way, overseer, elder, and pastor, they're all interchangeable within uh, the word here. So since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what God or what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Now, obviously this is a list for the elders of moral character, of instruction, to know the word of God to the point so you can defend the church, you can defend the gospel message, you can be able to call out those who are teaching a false version of it. But this is also, I don't know if you've ever done this, this is such an excellent list of things that we should all be working to adhere to. There's nothing in there in that list, and we're going to kind of pick it apart a little bit here, that, none, that any of us should say, well, I don't need to strive for that. This is a great list of things for us to go, 
wait a minute, I need to ask myself some questions. So here's like six questions I would ask, I'd say, ask yourselves this. I ask myself these questions because we need to line up with this if we're going to be a Christ follower. First of all, am I faithful to my spouse? That's, that's huge. That, obviously, God made these things up, right? He's the one that said, this is, this is what a, a, an elder looks like. This is what someone that I would put in charge of my churches should look like. Well, we should all want to strive for these things. Am I faithful to my spouse? Number two, am I leading by example and teaching my kids how to live for Christ? You know, how does my home life look? How do my kids look? Am I just dropping them off at church and hoping that Miss Jen and Hunter can work some magic? Because I'm not doing anything really to do much at home. I mean, I, they, they've, been, they've gone to school to do that kind of stuff. That, that's not what God calls us to. By the way, they didn't have Miss Jens and, and Hunters in, in their day. Okay, so they did it. And this is what you should be doing. You are in charge of your kiddos. What happens here should be kind of a supplement to what you're already doing in the home. Third, do people describe me as bossy or arrogant or quick-tempered? You know, I, I think we joke about this probably way too much, right? We, I'm not bossy, I just have better ideas, right? We, we, we kind of make a way to say it because we kind of know we're that way and we don't really want to deal with it, so we just try to kind of make a joke about it. And I know there's always room for a little bit of fun, but at the same time, if it's an issue, if you're kind of known as someone who's bossy and always, you know, maybe a little arrogant on the arrogant side or you're quick-tempered, it's not too hard for you to just kind of get really upset really fast. These are things that we should say, that's a problem. It's not something that we should say, well, I'm really good at a lot of other things, but this stuff, yeah, that's kind of a weakness of mine, but it's just who I am. No, that's, that should make us go, how do I get better at that? How do I focus on that? Because it's obviously something that God would want me to fix or get better at. Fourth, do I struggle with too much alcohol and getting drunk? That's a pretty, you know, plain one there. Am I out of control with that? Are there people telling me, man, woman, you're drinking too much? That's, yeah, I swear, I feel like, you, you, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm like, you, you may feel fine, but you're not fine. It's an issue, and you need to listen to the, hopefully you have those people in your life that will hold you accountable. Do people ever describe me as violent, right? They're like, man, you, you're rough. Like, you, I feel like you go out looking for a fight. Like, you're just, you're a violent person. Am I a dishonest person? That's the sixth one. These are things that we need to ask ourselves. These are things that God does not like. And they are things that a Christ follower should not be. And then we have these things here that, uh, or even, by the way, even if it's just one of those things, you're saying, I, I did pretty good on the list, actually. There's only one of them on there that's a real, even if there's one, fix it, work on it, grow in it. We should never be stagnant in our, in our walk with the Lord. So Paul then lists off this, these things that, that should make up our lives, right? These are things that people should see in us. And I'll go through these really quickly. Being uh, hospitality, right? And you're like, oh, that's my wife's job. She's good at that. No, actually, we are supposed to be people who welcome others, friendly people. We take care of others, meaning, you know, Jesus talked about this all the time. Think of others before yourself. We should be hospitable people. The second one is self-control. We don't do sinful things even though we really want to. We have self-control. Those things that we struggle with, those things that we're kind of like, man, that's a, that's a lot of fun, or I'm tempted to do that, or I really want to do that, or I really want to know what that's like, or what. It, but I've got self-control. I'm, I'm going to say no to that because I want to be who God's called me to be, and I know whatever that thing is, that's not of God. So we have self-control. Discipline is the next one. It kind of is an offshoot of this. We should have enough discipline that our priorities are God first and it, and it shows by our actions and our faithfulness to the things of God. We're disciplined in what we do. You know, it, it, we're consistent. And that discipline and self-control work together. Fourth one is holiness. There should be a holiness about us. Holiness is being set apart. Again, it doesn't mean you walk around with a robe like the Pope and you know, and you're, you're doing this kind of thing all the time. That's not what, you know, we think of holiness and we think, oh, these holy people. But we are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be set apart. People should be able to tell we're not like the rest of the world. Fifth one, knowledge of the word. We should know the word of God and what it says. Why? 
Why is that so important? Again, so we can encourage others with it and so we can refute those who are against it. I'm telling you, if we are lacking any of these things in this list, we, we should be making a huge making it a huge priority to work on it. Say, I got to get better at this. I got to figure out a way to get better at this. Because these are things that, yes, Paul was calling the elders to be, but, you know, we can read also elsewhere in Scripture, and we can see that these are also all things that we are called to as Christ's followers. Now, Paul's going to explain why these elders are so needed on this island, and uh, why the order is needing to be brought about. What, what's the big deal here? And it appears that a lot of the issue was around doctrine. Now, that's kind of a church word to be like, what the heck do you mean by doctrine? It's really just a set of beliefs, right? It's, it's the beliefs. It was kind of like what was being taught, what was being understood. It was the doctrine. It was the, the beliefs. What were the set of beliefs? And obviously, there was a big issue with this. So he says in verse 10, for there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they, they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. So we see there's just a lot of people there who were trying to teach things that were absolutely unbiblical. Again, we're seeing this today, this false teaching that is out there. These, these, and a lot of times it flows through politics Sometimes it, it, it'll flow through a really, really charismatic teacher that calls himself a, a Christ follower, and they, it just it tears apart households. It's happening today. And we should note, by the way, that these churches, again, they're fairly new. So Titus is looking, poor guy, he, he's looking for elders who have been Christians for only a short while. I mean, what he's got to choose from is maybe a year at the most, maybe two years I would maybe give it, but in many cases it may have been months. And he doesn't have this, oh good, I'm going to go find these people that have been Christians for 20 years. They've discipled a lot of people. They've been discipled themselves. They get it. It's, these are going to be the ones I put in in leadership positions. And Paul tells us that these elders are so needed because all these false teachers are around. They're, they're deceiving people. They're destroying families, false teachings. And then he highlights one of these groups that's being some of, the, I guess, the worst ones that are doing this, and he calls them the circumcision group. Now, circumcision was something that the Jewish men did as a part of a covenant that began with Abraham, okay? And so these Jewish men, the reason they were causing so much problem was they were going around and trying to convince the Gentiles that, listen, for you to really become a Christian, you have to follow all the ways of the, uh, uh, of the Jews. And they were confused because they're kind of like, well, wait a minute. I mean, we know that you guys do that, and that's a big deal, and you're, you were Christ followers, but what do you mean we have to do that too? Is that right? And they're confusing them because Paul did not teach that. And it, Paul preached that you did not have to become a Jew first before you became a Christian. Paul taught that God accepts anyone who comes to him in faith. So they were stirring up all kinds of confusion, confusion and it was a major problem that Titus was tasked was stopping. And we're going to see next that it, it wasn't just false teachers. These Cretans, these people that lived there, they were a, a pretty motley crew uh, of people that lived there on this island. They had a lot of their own issues, and we, we see this in verse 12. It says, one of the Cretes own prophets, so one of their own people that lived there, grew up there, their native, has said, had, has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And then Paul says, this saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to merely human commands of those who reject the truth. So you can see that Titus has this very difficult job ahead of him. This is why he is going to need these elders to, to rise up because he can't do it all by himself. And one of their own people said, listen, let me describe the people here to you. They're liars, they, they're evil, they're lazy. And so Titus has his work cut out for him for sure. There's obviously a huge character problem on this island, and this is why when you look at the type of people that Paul told Titus to select as leaders, he used character as such a big part of it. He said this is going to need to happen. They were going to need someone who was going to show them how it, you live like Jesus, modeling it for them. And here's what I love about this church. I don't know if you've sensed this or pulled us out of this or maybe just reading it over and over again, but I love this because we see how strongly Paul 
and Titus believe in the transformational power of the gospel message. They could have avoided this island. Do you realize that? Like if it was you and I, I'm not saying that we would have, but, and we're looking at where do we want to go next? What, what, and we know what the Cretans are all about. And we know they're a rough crew. I don't know that we'd be like, yeah, let's go there. We may have just said, you know what? We're just going to let them go to hell on their own. They're crazy. That's going to be so much work. They probably wouldn't listen to us. That's not the way they feel at all. These people, they knew they had a reputation of being horrible and being lazy, but instead of avoiding them or giving up on them, they have mercy on them, and they knew and believed in the power of the gospel to change them, so they're all in. They're probably also looking at themselves saying, listen, who, do, how, who am I to say that, that they can't change? God changed me. I was a horrible person. God changed me. And we need to have this kind of mindset as a people. How many of you believe the gospel has the same power still today to change people? Men, man, this is huge. We can't count anyone out. We can't avoid any group of people because we know our God is still capable of anything. Or at least we should be believing that. Well, let's continue. Verse 5. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. I want to give you an example of what Paul is meaning here, and I'll give you a few things that it's easy to make the connection. Take sex, food, and drink as an example. In and of themselves, those things are not corrupt, right? We are the ones who make sex, food, and drink corrupt when we use them in sinful and selfish ways. It, it, is, it is not that we are corrupted if we come around or come in contact with sex, food, or drink. Those things are corrupted when they come in contact with people with impure hearts. So things like sex, food, and drink are pure when we view them as good gifts from God and we use them for his glory and in line with his word. See, this is what Paul is trying to say by, to the pure, all things are pure. They, they're, it's good because they're being used in pure ways by pure people. But those same things can be corrupted and sinful. Sex can be turned into pornography super easy. It can be, you know, perverted in so many different ways. It can be uh, ruined through prostitution or something done outside of marriage, right? We're just... We don't really think of sex is sacred or that God, what God, we don't really care what God said about it. So we're, we're just having sex outside of marriage because of a lack of self-control and obedience to God's word. Food can become addictive and causes us to become unhealthy. It can become something that we turn to for comfort instead of God. Too much drink can turn us into different people, lead us to all kinds of sin. We've seen this. We've seen people be killed because... Someone drank too much. We've seen people make foolish decisions that ruined their entire lives because they drank too much. It can also be the same thing. It can be something that we turn to as an escape instead of turning to God. We see that a lot, right? So many people that turn, we, kind of a saying in our world, you know, they turn to the bottle, right? they trying to drink away their sorrows or whatever it may be. These things can be pure or they can be corrupt. Then we have this last verse of chapter one that says, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. So these people that Titus had to deal with were some of the most difficult because they talked a really good Christian game, right? They claim to know God, but their actions, they're denying him. So when you, when you see that, when you read that, you need to understand these, they were really good at leading people astray. They knew the right words to say, but they didn't live it out. And Paul and Titus wanted to warn these Christians on Crete to be careful not to be led astray by them. And again, this is so rampant in our world today. People that can say the right thing, they look the part, and we just go along with it. you got to know the word of God. So, sometimes I'll have people come to me, hey, have you read such and such? 
by so-and-so. And I'll be like, no, but you shouldn't be reading that either. Why? I mean, they're a Christian. Okay, they claim to be a Christian, but do you really know their belief? No, I don't know what they, I mean, I don't know. That doesn't matter. The book's great. But what you don't understand is, I guarantee you there's things in that book that you just skipped over or read or don't even have any question about, which you may then pass on to someone else because you don't realize that it's actually not in God's word or it's against God's word. We ha- and you're not going to know that. You're not going to read something and go, that's not right, unless you know what is in here to compare it with. And so this is what's happening. These people are just leading them astray. So in chapter one, we got that great inter- introduction, right, from Paul. Incredible list of virtues to strive for, a list of things we should be sure that, you know, we're never able to be said about us, especially verse 16. They claim to know God, but their actions deny them, deny him. And I said this last week, you know, when we read verses or even chapters or accounts like this, what we tend to do, and I'm as guilty as anybody, is we think of ourselves as the ones that are the good people in the story. In this case, we would think of, we would hope that we're the ones that Titus is going to be looking for. That Titus is going to say, I need you to lead this church. I need you to step up and, and you're one of these people. You, you fit the description here, at least most of it. And so I need you to, we hope that that's who we are in this story. And we, for sure, we should want that. But let me ask us, would we be? Let's bring it to 2022. Let's just say it's, it's today in America. Titus is here. He's been tasked with this because America's just as far gone as, as the island of Crete. Let's bring it home. Let's just say it's the, he's been tasked with the state of Florida. Maybe it'll even be better for us. Let's, let's make it smaller. Let's say he's been tasked with Wachula. And the, the, the saying would be, you know, those Wachulians, oh boy. Those people there, oof, they're a rough bunch. There's some characters. You, you know, you need to go find some leaders amongst the Wachulians to, to lead to be, and, and to be these type of peoples who I want you to look for. Would we be them? Would we be even willing to step up? Think about it that way. What if he came to you and he said, listen, I see that you, you do a pretty good job of leading this Christian life. You love God. You seem to know your word. You, you know, I, I'd look through these list of things, and I need you to step up, and I need you to lead and teach people to follow. Would we even step up, or would we be like, oh, you got the wrong girl. You got the wrong guy. It's not me. You know, we see more of that in the church than anything. It, it's not that there's not some really good people within the churches. There's some amazing people in our church. But you know, you know maybe you don't know the the pastoral side of things, but what we face a lot is the, just, we have a hard time finding people to lead. You know, I, I feel like I can get just about anybody, not anybody, but there's a lot of you that would volunteer to, hey, we need to rip these few benches out, and oh, we'll be there, we'll help clean it up, we'll do, you know, yep, we can do that kind of a thing. But when Casey picks up the phone and calls and says, we need some life group leaders, everybody's like, I'm out. I'm out, you know, I can't, while we're looking at people here in scripture in Titus's day, these people, they're only a year into this, maybe, if that, and yet they're going to be called to lead and set examples and go towards these people in Crete that were crazy. When we ask for life group leaders, we're saying either open up your home or meet in a room somewhere and just sit with other people that the majority of them are already going to love Jesus too. And study the word of God with them and, and help disciple people and, and help grow. And we're like, ah, not me, not me. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't. And we just back out. We, we're so afraid of, of leading, yet we should be. God is gifted. We, we have knowledge. We, and it's not that you have to have some PhD. You don't have to have some seminary degree to do these things. A lot of times that we're asking, but this seems to be the harder thing is to get people to, up to just say, hey, we lead. Will you take some leadership roles? Will you... Will you teach a class? Will you, I just, man, I, you got the wrong person. We shouldn't be getting the wrong person. You should be trying to become the right person. None of us are perfect. But we should be wanting to learn, wanting to know. Matter of fact, and, and we've got classes already that we teach from time to time to try to help with that. And I don't want to ruin anything or spoil anything. We've got some things coming that are going to be more classes for us to be able to say, I'm going there and I'm going to get the knowledge I need to get because I want to step up and I want to be able to lead better. I want to know more. Um, 
And so that's coming down the pike as well. We're going to provide it for you. And I hope that people will step up. What I do know is this. And I don't have any time left, but I really want to talk about this for just a second. And God has just, you know, I don't know if you guys are like this, but sometimes God will put something on your heart and you're just like, man, I can't get, get this off my mind. I can't get this out of my heart. It's just like it's there. And I just, I shared this with the elders at our elders meeting last week. You know, this kind of theme or this thought that he's put in my mind, and maybe it's because I'm old, I don't know, but it's, or older, um, is the brevity of life. You know, sometimes I think certain things are just heavier on you. And I, I've just thought about it. I think about it all the time, like the brevity of life, not in a way that I'm scared to die or anything like that. It's more so just how short it really is. You read in scripture all the time and they say, it's a, your life is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. You know, we know that, but I want us to, I want you to set your mind on this for a minute. The first 20 years of our life, all we're doing is just trying to, first of all, we're trying to stay alive because some of us are making stupid choices. But we, we, if we make it to 20, you know, you know, and our parents are trying to help us get there. And by the time we're around 20 years old, we start going, you know what? Wait a minute. I'm like a, like a real adult now. Like I actually probably should be thinking to do something with my life. And then we spend those next few years, 21, 22, 23, 24, and we're starting to go, okay, what am I going to really do like long term? What do I, sh- I need to start thinking, what, what's my life going to look like for the rest of my life? And then we, you know, some of us at that, in that time frame to 25, 26, 20, we, we get married maybe, and that's not for everybody, but some of us do. And, and we start going, okay. And then, and then maybe have some kids along the way there. And then we get to about 30 years old. And we're, we're looking back and we're like, you know what? We really need to get serious. We need to get serious because now we got kids, we got responsibilities. Um, I, I'm getting older. I need to, how, what am I doing with my life? I, I, can't, I can't be doing the stuff I was doing when I was 21 anymore or 16. You know, I, I got to be an adult. I need to, and we start, usually we've been working our way up maybe somewhere. We're, we're maybe, you know, becoming a little more successful. And so really, I feel like it's around 30 years old that, we might, and some people start earlier, and thank God, and those people are amazing, but around 30 years old, we start seeing people go, wow, what the heck am I going to do now? I need to, let's do this. I'm going to get more focused. I'm going to get more intent on what I'm doing and how I'm living. And so let's just say you do that at 30 years old. What's hit me is we have about a 40-year time span. Now, those of you that are like 70 years old, I'm not saying you're dead and done. I'm not, please don't, let me, let me finish my thought. But you've got 40 to 40 years there, so then when, you know, on the set, when you're 70 years old, you are thinking differently than what you were thinking when you were 30 years old. And you are starting to think about, you know, maybe you are retired, or you're about to be retired, or you hope that you're going to be able to retire one day. And, and you start realizing, hey, these later years of my life, I'm going to maybe do things a little bit differently. But that 40-year span is where we tend to be what we say our prime time to be able to really maybe give back and do and, and really do a whole lot of stuff with our lives. We have more energy. We feel better. We're not at the doctor every day. You know, I, these are what my 70-year-old friends tell me. You know, but you, 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 you've changed things. Your life has changed at this point. So I start thinking 40 years, wow. And then, I, then what I do with this brevity thing that's been happening is now I'm looking at me and, and I'm not 30 anymore. And so I start going, I've been here 22 years. Darren, what have you done with those 22 years that you've been in Wachula? Yeah, the church has grown and we've baptized a whole lot of people and we've seen some great things happen in families and people come to know the Lord and all that's, and, and I'm not negating any of that. That's awesome. But what I think of next is I go, wait a minute, if I just, add 20 more years to this thing, which is less than the amount of time I've been here so far, I'll be 68 years old. You guys will be done with me by then, if not before. You're going to be like, dude, you're old now. We need somebody else to be up there talking. We've heard all your stuff, and we we need to move on. And so I start thinking, let's just say if God is gracious, and the elders are gracious, and you're gracious, and I've got 20 more years here. That's so short. That's so short, y'all. We've got a, like, or I've got, let me speak for myself, a 20-year run here of where I could really probably make a bigger difference than maybe say, God can do anything, but maybe say the, the end of my life there. So I start thinking about that, and it's like, what are we going to do? Y'all, we're, God brought us together. God's grown, God's grown our church. The ones that are here today, the people that are watching online, the people that aren't here today, the, the, but consider this our church, what are we here for? What are we doing together? Why has God brought us together as a team? Who's going to step up and be in, in leadership? Who's going to step up and say, let me help lead. Let me help take on this, the, what we're trying to accomplish here. How are we going to reach this community for Jesus? 
you know, we, we've, we've seen great things. We've got phase one's almost done. We'll be talking about that here in, soon, which is really cool. It's really, really close. Phase two, we're almost finished with everything as far as drawings go. Like, we had to update some things because of good reasons. But, again, I don't want to get off topic. So all this stuff's coming, and it's going to require all of us to step up and be a part of it and for that next generation. But that brevity of life, and it's like, okay, we're here. God's put us among not the Cretans, but the Wachulians. Now, what are we doing? Are we counting them out? We're like, oh, we don't deal with those people. They're lost. They're crazy. Or do we really believe in the transformational part of the gospel message? Church, we have so much knowledge and love to offer to those who are lost. And, and let me say this, and I promise I'm going I'm to be done. God isn't asking us to go around and yell at people and shame people by saying, you shouldn't be doing that. Let me tell you, you're going to hell. That, that's not what God wants us to do. That, that's, that's not the approach. He wants us to give them the gospel. And the gospel says, no, you shouldn't do that. Or you shouldn't do this. But it's because Jesus offers you something bigger and better. We, we, we want them to fall in love with Jesus. We want them to see he's got a better plan for their life than the way they're living. And we need to love them and teach them. We, we don't just come to church here. We are... We are tasked just like Titus. We are tasked with a mission. Do we realize this? I love, John Stott said this. When false teachers increase, we must multiply the number of true teachers. Well, it isn't real hard to see that false teachers are increasing. So we need to step up as people who are going to teach the true gospel, who are going to stand for what it really means. It is time we multiplied, church. It is time we stepped up and stepped into the work that God has called us to. And I think it's interesting. This kind of hit me as I was going through this. Much like Paul left Crete and he left Titus there and said, hey, here's the work I want you to do. Jesus did the same thing, y'all. He left and he said, here, here's a whole bunch of books. I didn't even just write you one. Titus got one letter here. God says, here you go. I'll be back. And while I'm gone, this is what I want you to do. And so many of us, this just sits on the shelf. We don't even really know besides what we kind of heard other people talk about. And there's a different book that the world is reading and, and going after. And this is no longer the moral compass that America is looking toward. And so they're creating their own moral compasses and what they think is right. And it's becoming just like it tells us in Scripture and many other places that were around the world. Is they're just doing whatever they feel like is right in their own eyes. And that's why we're getting, that's where we're at today. That's why, our, that's why America is falling and falling away from God. It's because, why we see so much of the violence and just the hate. And it's, we've gone away from this. There's no order. So what do we do? Do we cower? Do we just say, yeah, kind of sucks to be in America. I guess we'll just see what happens. Or do we say, no, wait a minute, I have the answer. I know the answer. I, wait a minute, I believe in the gospel. I believe the gospel is transformational. I believe it can transform people's lives. And not just people, but the worst of the worst. And so I'm going to go out like Paul. I'm going to go out, you know, knowing I'm running the race and I'm doing the best I can do. And I'm involved and I'm doing stuff, not just within the church, but outside the church. And I'm I'm. I know I've only got a short amount of time, and so I'm going to invest it. I'm not going to spend it doing stuff that's stupid, that's just useless. It's not going to matter in eternity. This is going to matter. So I just want to challenge you with that. I want that to just hopefully take root in your heart. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue on with this, this book next week and, and continue to see what happens. It's pretty awesome. So make sure you... Tune in next week or come next week as we continue to go through this. But let this be what kind of ruminates in your heart and mind this next week. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.